Welcome to our latest installment of Lecture and Film, our uh, retrospective this year of the work of Luis Buñuel. We'll be looking tonight at his uh, film Los Olvidados, a uh, Mexican production from 1949. And uh, we have the very special pleasure to have an introduction on the film by Dudley Andrew. Um, if I were to give a full list of the accomplishments of Dudley Andrew in the field of film studies, we would be here all night. Uh, we'll be here all night anyway, but you know that's. Uh, uh, I don't want to make things uh, too excessive. Uh, he's really one of the founding figures of film studies in North America, uh, part of the let's say first generation of uh, scholars who really dedicated themselves. Uh, to the study of cinema and to the establishment of film studies as, as an academic field in its own right. He initially taught at uh, Iowa University, which alongside NYU was one of the two real kind of early crucibles of uh, film studies in, uh, in the United States uh, before moving to Yale University uh, in the year 2000, uh, where he taught up until... Uh, his recent retirement, although he still teaches, uh, he has the film studies bug uh, incurably uh, and uh, so continues to teach on cinema, continues to uh, research cinema, continues to write uh, on cinema up to the present day and continues to give lectures uh, all over the world. Um, he, uh, the name Dudley Andrew is in, inseparably linked to uh, another name in film theory, namely that of Andre Bazan, uh, because uh, I think Dudley Andrew has uh, indisputably done the most to, uh, let's say, transmit the theory of Andre Bazan, particularly to uh, an international uh, public. His early research focused on the life and writings of Bazan. In fact, he wrote a kind of uh, seminal biography of Andre Bazan published by uh, Cahiers de Cinema's uh, uh, publishing house itself, uh, and indeed even opened up the eyes of the French cinephile world to uh, Bazin's life and his uh, profound contribution uh, to the development of film theory. Uh, Dudley was also has also been responsible for two key uh, anthol or let's say overview uh, texts of film theory, the major film theories and the major film concepts, which uh, have really, I think. Uh, enabled multiple generations of students of film studies to gain a grasp on uh, the history of film theory, how it's developed from the uh, early days up until our present. Uh, he's also written uh, monographies on uh, Breathless by Jean-Luc Godard and Sancho the Bailiff by uh, Kenji Mizuguchi. Uh, more recently, he's also returned uh, to a focus on Andre Bazan, uh, uh, which resulted in the uh, major edited collection uh, opening Bazan, uh, co-edited with Hervé joubert Laurentin, which I think is a very decisive uh, contribution to uh, making uh, the, the ideas of Bazan relevant to uh, contemporary issues in, in cinema. Um, at around the same time, that was roughly 10 years ago, he uh, also published a book which I consider personally to be uh, the most militant book in film studies in the 21st century, What Cinema Is, exclamation uh, mark, where he really gives us uh, a kind of our view of what what makes for great cinema. Uh, I think we'll, I think Los Alvedadas, uh, What Cinema Is really is focusing on contemporary cinema, but I think Los Alvedadas would be, well, let's say, an example of that in uh, Buñuel's own day, uh, but Dudley continues really to write on uh, on Bazan, uh, but also on many other issues, uh, uh, particularly with respect to world cinema, so really uh, giving a global view uh, of uh, the development of cinema, particularly in recent um, decades. Um, and uh, I just wanted to end my, like, uh, my grab bag of remarks about Dudley's uh, work with... Um, I guess a, a, a small note, he was, uh, I think he received the Lifetime Achievement Award at SCMS, the North American Film Studies Conference in 2011. Uh, and kind of basically the entire discipline was gathered uh, to um, uh, celebrate Dudley's 
uh, career in film studies stretching uh, back to the 1970s. And at one point, uh, the room was asked to, uh, like, everyone who had been, uh, who had studied under Dudley to uh, raise their hands. And it was something like, I think, three quarters of the room uh, raised their hands uh, to say, you know, they'd, they'd really been um, very directly um, let's say mentored by Dudley, so he's really the kind of the, in the family tree of film studies. Dudley is really the kind of like the Uranus figure uh, at the at the origins there. Um, and I was also one of those people who raised my hand. Uh, he was what the Germans like to call the the Doctor Vater for me. He uh, supervised uh, my own PhD uh, a few years ago at Yale. So for that reason, I'm tremendously proud uh, that we can bring him to Frankfurt. Uh, to talk about an incredible film, uh, Los Salvadados. Um, so I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Dudley up to the lectern. Um, and uh, just one note on the format. This is, of course, a lecture in film. Uh, he'll be talking for roughly 50 to 60 minutes. Um, we'll then have a 10-minute break, and we'll watch the film, which is about 80 minutes long. And then we have the tr real highlight of the evening, which is the audience discussion afterwards, which you're all uh, invited uh, to stick around for. So please uh, welcome Dudley to the lectern. Uh, thanks uh, so much. It's very moving for me to hear Danny talk up that way. And if he's proud of having been one of my students long ago, uh, I'm really proud of him. He's done tremendous work. Fantastic publication that came out recently and uh, just one of many. You're lucky to have him here in Frankfurt, and what I love about the situation here is the coordination between uh, the, uh, the university, many of whose members uh, I know, I know something about the, the program there, and uh, this university in the city, which is just very exceptional. It's really wonderful to see so many people here. Um, so thanks for coming. I was here last time, just uh, months before the pandemic closed this place down, uh, talking about Zsa Zsanka, and I had one of the exceptional evenings of my life discussing the film afterwards. So I'm definitely going to leave time for it. That film was two hours and 30 minutes. This one is only 80 minutes. That doesn't mean I'll take an uh, excessive amount of time speaking, but I really am looking forward to the discussion. I will not speak much about the film. Uh, because I like to do that afterwards. Uh, so there'll be some, a couple of images from it, but mainly I want to talk around the film and get you ready for it. And in fact, to do what I can do best with this film, which is to situate it in its moment and just to kind of to pretend that uh, we're all here as if we were at its first screening, which was its first big screening, which was at Cannes in April of 1951. And it's one of those rare occasions uh, when uh, something unexpected startles the film community, making everybody alert that they're going to be startled again and again by the person who just brought them to their attention. In 1951, when this film, Los Olvidados, hit, hit its target, Louis Bunuel's name was not unknown. He had made three shocking films about 20 years earlier, but the longest of these, L'Age d'Or, had been so successfully censored that only a very few people could remember seeing it during its brief exposure in 1930, and it was really closed down. And I remember when I first saw it in 1974, you had to have a plain, special plane seat had to be <laughs> given to the film. It had to be guarded by people. Now it's available to anyone, but it was really difficult to see. The other two films he made, whose names you've probably heard many times here and probably have heard lectures on, uh, were Un Chien Andalou, The Andalusian Dog, and Las Hurdes, Land Without Bread. Both are powerful and absolutely unforgettable. But they also are specialty items. They're shorts, under half an hour each. Uh, and they can be said to belong to art history as much as to film history. And they play in museums. They played in museums uh, as much as, in fact, Las Cerdas hardly played in movie theaters, um, as far as I know. Um, so they were, Bunuel effectively disappeared from the film scene. It was never thought to be a feature director, although he made a couple of films in Spain uh, during the uh, Civil War. Uh, commercial works, but nobody knew about them. And he um, made it over to the United States where he was effectively lost. People thought he was gone and they would never hear from him again. Um, many people thought that was just as well. In fact, he was thought to be, he was a performance artist almost, um, putting on things that caused a stir, riots. Police had to come out when with those first three films. Um, but the economic depression followed by the Second World War really was uh, a place, a time that sidelined rebels. 
Um, and then came, after the war, the Berlin Airlift and uh, the uh, Cold War. So even the Communist Party, to which he was always close and belonged in some respects, even during this period, but, um, but only to the side at this time, they uh, demanded a kind of conformity and obedience that he was not willing to give. Look at Louis Aragon, one of his greatest friends in the 1920s and early 30s, right around 1930 and 31. He had once been the most imaginative and fiery poet alive, I think, along with Elward, maybe. But he became a predictable spokesperson for the party, and his novels were, in my view, obvious and very legible. Bunuel once had been very linked to Aragon, but he, but he, he, he just... Um, would never write, make any kind of righteous political allegory. Instead, he made something much more powerful and disturbing. He made Los Olvidados. Bunuel was back, and he was not at, in the least reformed, except in one respect. Whereas his avant-garde shorts were meant to grab the recognition of the European intelligentsia, and especially the artistic elite, they were produced by the elite, effectively. He got money from noblemen uh, to make these films, to shock them. Well, Los Olvidados aimed for general recognition. He wanted it to be discussed by critics alongside films of Hitchcock and Preston Sturgis and Vittorio De Sica. He wanted his film to play in theaters and to be recognized generally. And so it happened. Yet, as you're about to find out, or if you recall, if you've seen it before, um, you will recall it when you see it. Los Alvidades is hardly a standard movie. It's single-minded and it's relentless. It's definitely not designed to please the eye or the mind or your general good health. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, its distinctiveness comes into best light, I think, in two ways, and that's what I want to concentrate on. First, by setting it in its precise moment in film history, what was the feel like that it kind of landed like an alien spacecraft? And no nobody knew it was coming. It just suddenly showed up at Khan, and uh, there it was. They had to deal with it. And second, I want to insist on Bunuel's abiding characteristics, things that all stayed with him from the beginning to the very end. So there's the timeliness of it, 1951, when it came out, and there's the timelessness of Bunuel's attitude. Because he showed up at Cannes really in the same way that he showed up in Paris in 1925. He hadn't touched a camera in his life, but in 1926 he did, and he never separated himself from it after that. He would always, from first to last, stand ready to be defined, but not limited to his commitments to th three big things, I think. Surrealism, mainly through André Breton, with whom he's extremely close. Then Marxism through Marx, uh, and then poetry through his very close friend, uh, Garcia Lorca, and others too. But it was Lorca, he was very close to Lorca. And in fact, you'll, you'll hear that he was on his way to make a film about by Lorca when he made Los Olvidados. These three interrelated anchors made him confident and happy in himself throughout his life. He was extremely um, confident and self um, self-agreeable man. He just liked his life. He didn't like things in the world, but he said, I know what I'm doing. I know who I am. And he never wavered from that feeling. There is one more term that needs to be added to those, that list of surrealism. Uh, ethnography, really, I would call it, instead of Marxism. It's a Marxist ethnography. Es surrealism, ethnography, and poetry. I would add, and must add, the word cinema. Because Bunuel recognized himself first as a person of cinema once he touched that camera. Even in the presumably lost 15 years between Land Without Bread, Las Herdes, uh, and his uh, Los Olvidados when he suddenly reappeared, he earned his living in the film world. Nobody knew he was doing this, or very some people did, his employers, of course, but no, the film critics and so on, nobody uh, knew that he was out there. But he never stopped imagining what he could do if given a chance. Los Olvidados gave him that chance, and we've been talking about him and it ever since. The actual itinerary of those 15 years is pretty labyrinthine, and it takes you from minor productions of tawdry Spanish melodramas uh, to the major studios of Hollywood um, briefly, and to the Museum of Modern Art, where he also worked a bit, and then uh, to Denise Tual um, and, um, and Mexico, and I'll, uh, that's what I want to get into here a bit. Denise Tual uh, is someone I want to mention because uh, I got to know her fairly well when I was working on my biography of Bazin. Uh, and um, she's long since dead, but she was the widow of uh, Pierre Batchev, who played, plays the role in Andalusian Dog and Chien Andalou. Uh, he committed suicide shortly after the film, 
and then she remarried um, Roland Tuol, and they became a power couple of pro producers. She edited Jean Renoir's La Chienne, and um, she's, she's a very interesting woman. And they were a small uh, publish, uh, production house. They were really just doing specialty items, but they did two very powerful films, um, <coughs> Espoir by André Malraux and Bresson's first feature film, Les Anges de Péché, in, in 1943. So uh, she's an impressive person, and she was the one that got Bunuel going here. So I want to mention her for sure. One gets the impression from Bunuel's writings and from the historians who have traced his movements that it scarcely mattered where he went. He was determined to remain in the environment of filmmaking, and he believed that at some point he was going to get the opportunity to do what he was dead certain he could do, that is, to make a force make a film that forces you to watch it and never forget. And so he made The Forgotten Ones, which is the t English title of uh, Les Ovidados. It didn't take much. It took $50,000 in 18 days shooting, far less than films by Preston Sturges, Hitchcock, and De Sica, with whom I met, matched him earlier. There are quite a few good accounts of the making of this film. I'm not going to talk too much about them, in fact, at all, really. It's, uh, and it's quite difficult birth. But let me highlight... Uh, mainly his work with uh, Oscar Danciger, um, who was the producer of this film. Russian-born and Jewish, Danciger has produced a couple German films before moving uh, to France, where he actually maintained his nationality. He, he considered himself French. And throughout the 1930s, he worked in France and produced about nine films, I've calculated. One of them, um, only one has, I think, any ambition. This is my field. I really love the 1930s in France, and I've really not seen his films. They're, they're fairly run-of-the-mill. But one of the Moutonnet in 1936 starred Michel Simon and Noël Noël. Uh, and it was uh, uh, written in part by Jacques Prévert. Um, and so he, this is how he met uh, Denis Tuol. And this is how he would later stay in touch with uh, Jacques Prévert, who had a lot to do with the success of this film. Bunuel was languishing in Hollywood when he met Denise Tuol, who flew to Hollywood because uh, right after World War II, she was well known for Les Anges de Péché and the Ministry Center to try to drum up co-productions with Mexico. That was her mission. She wanted to go to Hollywood first to see Jean Renoir, whom, with whom, you know, because she had edited La Chienne and knew him well. And she also wanted to see René Claire, with whom she was very close. And she wanted to see Louis Bunuel, whom she knew from you know, She and Andalou. She knew him when he made, she was there <laughs> making Andalusian Dog. Um, he had just lost his job uh, at uh, Warner Brothers, where he was doing subtitling and uh, second versions du uh, dubbing for Spanish versions of their films. But they didn't need them so much after the war ended, and he he lost his job. He was out of work, and he had a family, and he was uh, had an expensive expensive enough place in L.A. They embraced. They had a great reunion, and she said, "Well, look, I'm going to Mexico." <laughs> like in two days, you, you want to come down with me? I've got a project to present to Don Siger, uh, this producer whom she knew. He was the only person she knew in Mexico, but he had a pretty good operation going there, making uh, a series of, uh, well, he was a producer, he was making consistent movies in, um, in Mexico. So she was going down there and she wanted to pitch The House of Bernarda Elba, Garcia Lorca's most famous play, to uh, Don Siger and say, we can make a film of it. And she said, Louis, you can, you can direct, you know. He said he didn't really like that play, he said, but he would, he, he was, he, it sounded like a good deal. So they went down and they pitched this to uh, Don Siger, uh, who said, this is way too highbrow. I make tawdry melodramas and light comedies. That's what the Mexican people want right now. We're not going to make this film, probably. But she still thought she would make it, maybe back in France. But then Lorca's brother uh, had no interest in anything but money, and he sold the rights to somebody else for more. And actually, Bunuel was a bit relieved. Meanwhile, or in fact, almost immediately, Don Siger, who knew of Bunuel, they had actually met for about five minutes or so, evidently, at a cafe in Paris in 1938. But So he knew what he looked like, and that was about it. But he knew his reputation, and he knew he had been working and had made films, and a couple of films on, on budget in Spain. He told him he had done so. So Don Siger said, why don't you try to make the, uh, this? He let him do two films, one of which was um, a pretty big success. Cheap. Uh, not impressive. Bunuel thought it meant nothing to him, but he wanted to make. He tried to make it as well as he could, and it made money. And Don Siger then hired him for a nine-film contract, 
And he said, you know, you can have some independence. Why don't you make something that you care about? And that's when, um, uh, that's when he got the idea to make a film on the downtrodden uh, kids in, in Mexico City, which he had come to, to learn about and to be shocked by. Los Avedados was then the third feature film that Bunuel made uh, after having left Europe. And it was the first over which he had real control. Excoriated as a nasty national portrait in Mexico, it, it was, even some of the people on the crew and cast refused to watch it and said they'd never work with him again because it so demeaned its own country, they said. It only lasted three days in the theater. It had no special red carpet treatment. But it gained exceptional traction on the European continent, where it was championed foremost by Octavio, Octavio Paz, Jacques Prévert, and then, after he saw it at the Con, André Bazin, with whom Bunuel would form a fast friendship. At that 1951 April Con Festival, Bunuel was crowned best director of the festival. Francois Truffaut was living with Bazin at the time when he saw it, and he made sure to seek out Bunuel once he began to work at Cahiers du Cinéma. These are some of the people, some of the names, just so you can, in case my pronunciation's poor, you can see who I'm speaking about. So Truffaut was uh, was living with Bazin. They saw the film. Uh, Truffaut then, in 1953, it wasn't until 53 that Truffaut was in a position to start to work uh, seriously at Cahiers. He was writing small reviews, but he got to interview uh, directors at that point. And the very first interview that he ever gave to a director was Bunuel in 1953. There they are, a little bit later, but the, you can see them together. He asked Bunuel not about Los Olvidados or any of the other films that had just come out, but about what f kind of film he would make I if he wanted to. What is the film you most want to make, Louis? And Bunuel replied, I'd invent the same kind of characters as in my usual films, but they'd each possess the characteristics of certain insects. The heroine would act like a bee, the priest would be a beetle. It'd be a film about instinct. Well, Truffaut immediately understood that this director, famous for delivering hallucinations and Freudian symbols, was in fact the least psychological of artists. He had no interest in character motivation, but only in their behavior. He treated this behavior coldly, as a structural element in scripts that he prepared with the utmost rigor. Truffaut always was interested in script writing, and he thought Bunuel's scripts, especially Archibaldo de la Cruz, was magnificent. Well, Truffaut got his ideas about modernism, especially anti-psychology from Bazin, who was grappling with this very aesthetic himself, especially because he had just seen and was trying to figure out how to write about Bresson's Journal d'un Curé de Campagne, Diary of a Country Priest, which had just come out. So he, when he went to Cannes, he saw Los Olvidados uh, along with Bazin, and he could see that Bazin was trying to complete his great essay on the stylistics of Robert Bresson, maybe the greatest essay on any film that anybody's ever written, some people think. Hugh Gray, his translator, at least says so. Anyway, that film, he realized, both films were rigorously anti-psychological, despite the introspection uh, of the hero in, in, um, in the diary film, of course. It may seem heretical, but Bunuel, like Bresson, aimed to reveal something unknown and unknowable in humans, something that reason cannot penetrate. Both these directors tried to capture the behavior, the instinctual gestures, and the looks of those who suffer and fail to connect with others. The lonely forgotten ones are perfect models for these artists, for these two artists, these two filmmakers. The difference might be that Bresson concentrated on a single tormented soul, that of the country priest, while Bunuel was going to take up a set of disaffected souls who torment each other. Bresson and Bunuel were born uh, just a year apart. Their breakout films ranked among Cahiers du Cinema's top film, 10 films of the year. This is the very first year of Cahiers du Cinema's existence. It starts in April 1951. At the end of the year, they said, top 10 films. They've continued to do things like that. And the top film, well, the top, among the top 10 films were these two, for sure. They have both were shot on location, a rural location, and an urban location, respectively. 
and both move fatally toward death in increasingly grim circumstances. Both men gambled that this method and subject matter would be their way of distinguishing themselves, or perhaps they didn't care. Perhaps they were trying to make the kind of cinema that they believed in, and they, they took it to an extreme that, that nevertheless drew attention, favorable attention, as it turned out. There's an excellent study of Bresson that came out that I'm uh, attached to, um, The Invention of Robert Bresson, and it carries a really telling subtitle. It's called The Auteur and, its, and His Market. Beyond this enigmatic and mystical master, Bresson, the, the author, Colin Burnett, argues that a savvy public relations man sat, sat there who understood the changing tastes of the critics and the public. And that's just, that public relations man was the director himself. Bresson had worked in public relations, actually, and, and um, maybe figured out how to market himself. Did he calculate the best way to enter the market by establishing his authorial vision? For instance, he eliminated actors so does Bunuel in this film. <laughs> Why not? They could no longer rival him for space on the marquee or in advertising posters or in film reviews. Bresson also treated the spectator rudely, not as rudely as Bunuel does, but he treated him rudely, believing that after the war, in the era of existentialism, this was a perverse attraction. He expected audiences to follow him at his own pace into the dark world of the soul. Burnett talks about Bresson this way without trying to be cynical. His approach actually is drawn from an art historian that means a lot to me, um, Michael, um, Michael Baxendahl, who insists that artists set themselves topics and styles that deliberately challenge or flatter the particular mental skills and proclivities uh, of their benefactors. And those benefactors change. Baxendahl writes about Giotto and the church uh, and some noble, noble people. He writes definitely about uh, his, one of his great books is on Piero della Francesco and the, uh, and the merchants of Florence who he knew how to address and, and, and challenge and make, make, make difficult puzzles, visual puzzles for them that they, they cared about. He wasn't trying to, and, and then he goes on to talk about Picasso who didn't care about merchants anymore. <laughs> he cared about his agent and other artists. And anyway, this is uh, Baxendahl's point and he makes it brilliantly across a long career. Burnett picks him up. I hope you got that idea from me. I've, I've been pushing that for a long time. I really like that idea. And he says that Bresson was doing something of the same. He knew that the cognoscenti uh, no longer really cared about Hollywood films, uh, classical Hollywood films in the normal way. They wanted something modern. But they didn't really want modern idea films, uh, the kind of films that the French were making is in what's known as the tradition de qualité, films with uh, up, uplifting or correct, even pessimistic, often moral ideals and ideas, uh, and often drawn from uh, quality novels, high stan standard, high-minded films. He didn't wa want that. He wanted films for the people who were reading Sartre and Camus and Richard Wright and who were looking at paintings by Tapier and by Fautrier and listening to either black jazz musicians or Olivier Messiaen. That's what he thought he ought to go for. And he made Diary of a Country Priest, and it turned out to be a popular success. Burnett. Burnett's idea, I think I can transfer to Bunuel, who thought um, that he would make a film as part of the uh, what I'm calling the, have called the accursed tradition. Accursed is the English translation we give to the word uh, modi, modi, and the, f uh, you can see the, in the second PowerPoint point there, the Festival of the Accursed Films, Le Film Modi, was held at Biarritz in July 1949. That festival was put on by Jean Cocteau, whom Bunuel knew extremely well from the 1930 period, um, and Bazin. It was pointedly anti-con, showing films rejected by the studios, distributors, and critics of good taste, but fascinating to real cinephiles, like Truffaut, Rivet, Romer, all these people attended. These were very young men. Truffaut was Bazin's assistant at the festival. He was 18. <laughs> um, so they all met together there, and they saw uh, these filmmakers and films. Bresson was held up there as a chief accursed filmmaker, along with Jean Vigo. They were the real artists because they surrendered glamour and suspense in favor of a relentlessly pursued style and subject. Cinephiles were prepared to have their faces rubbed in pessimism and in a non-rational but objective world manifesting the human species at its most basic and essential. So the spiritual agony of Bresson's country priest is, I'm suggesting, on a par with Bunuel's urchins 
and their ugly struggle, struggle to stay alive. For Bazin, cinema turns both these agonies into acts of artistic love. Had it been a year uh, earlier, Los Olvidados, which is distributed as The Forgotten Ones in English, would de definitely have been programmed as a film maudit. Having left Europe, I'm, I'm, I want to compare him in a way to Arthur Rimbaud, that's where they got the name, Le Poète Maudit, somebody who left Europe for something south. For, for Rimbaud, it was Africa. For Bunuel, it's Mexico. And, um, and a culture which is very alien. The difference is that Bunuel, unlike Rimbaud, wanted to resurrect his reputation and come back, if only to be able to work consistently and to make the kinds of films that were bubbling in his outrageous imagination. He thought of returning to Mexico, um, from Mexico to Europe, and he kept up with what was going on in France all along. Maybe it was only out of spite that he surely kept up with, a, he didn't particularly like Cocteau, um, but um, he certainly had to pay attention because Cocteau had made the transition from surrealism as a darling of 1930s with Blood of a Poet, Le Song d'un Poète, to feature filmmaker with a really good sized audiences um, that opened it at Cannes. For instance, he opened the first Cannes with La Belle et la Bête, Beauty and the Beast. Um, and he also played um, in his film Orphe, Orpheus, played in the 1950 Cannes Right when Bunuel was editing Los Olvidados, he wouldn't have seen the film, but he would have known that it was being uh, showing. So he certainly could sense that he wanted to join that group. <laughs> if Cocteau could move from a film sponsored by the Viscount de Noé, like The Blood of a Poet in 1930, to feature filmmaking of this sort, why couldn't he do the same? Because his film was also the same year, Lodge d'Or, sponsored by the same Comte de Noé. Bresson, who made an experimental short in the, in the 30s, had been associated with the Surrealists also. And he had made the transition to features. So Bazin thought of, of Bresson um, as leading, and of Cocteau, as leading a whole, into a whole new terrain. He, Bazin wrote this manifesto called Pour une nouvelle avant-garde. And he was there, thereby proclaiming that the old avant-garde was the avant-garde of the silent period in the early sound films of 1930 that were made for this elite company of uh, museum goers and, uh, and you know, cultural people, dandies. And you know, I'm making a prejudicial remark here, but uh, he, he felt it was a very specialized audience. And Bazan always felt cinema was for the masses, at least. But it needed an avant-garde to push it and to help Im improve the masses, to at least give them something more ambitious to, uh, to hope for and to demand of their films. His manifesto came out in the summer of 1949. He could have had Bunuel in mind as much as Cocteau because Bunuel pitched his project, Los Olvidados, on September 5th, 1949, by saying, quote, I hope Los Olvidados will be something exceptional in the current world of international filmmaking. It is hard and strong without the slightest concession to the audience. Realistic, yes, but with a subtle current of fierce and sometimes erotic poetry. This is before he had, he had written it, but he had yet to, he had pitched, that's how he pitched it. He wanted to be in the midst of international filmmaking, and he was nowhere. He was completely unknown in, this, in Mexico, which he, a place that he abhorred when he first thought of having to go there. He, did, he had no interest in Latin America. Uh, but he said, I better stay here because I've got a foothold here. Uh, and he began to like it, and he lived the rest of his life there. But uh, he did want to be recognized and to be part of the group that had made such a splash earlier in Paris. So he needed a larger audience. Um, he didn't want, and, and he found it. In fact, uh, as I've noted, Bunuel's fortune was made when awarded the best director in, at Cannes in 51, and Bresson's Journal d'un Curé de Campagne took the Golden Lion a couple of months later at Venice. So Bazin felt vindicated. The avant-garde was, in fact, getting the attention that needed to pull mainstream cinema towards something more mature than Hollywood fluff. And so perhaps Biarritz, the Festival de Film Modi, the accursed films, had chastised Khan enough so that Khan could feel it had to reward something as unglamorous as Bunuel's film. Actually, it was as director as, uh, that he got the prize. It wasn't um, his film that got the prize. The grand prize that year went to Miracolo in Milano, Miracle in Milan, by De Sica. 
So the jurors saw a relation between Bunuel and Vittorio De Sica, because Bunuel had kept track of the tremendous sense, uh, success of the first Italian film, uh, neo realist film, to reach um, it, the, the world, and that was Shusha and Shusha. And we can't escape the fact that De Sica's Shusha has a lot in common with Los Alvidados. In fact, it helped get it started. He, his producer, Don Siguer, thought of Susha as giving them license to go straight into the ghetto and expect to come out not just alive, but successful. And De Sica's young ghetto boys, uh, who, who go from the ghetto into what turns out to be much better conditions in jail, <laughs> um, uh, live by talking about they have a, a, a kind of stake in a horse that they dream of being able to ride later on. So there is a kind of dreamlike quality of shoeshine that is in, involved in this animal horse. Um, but uh, Bunuel found De Sica, however, to be way too sentimental and perhaps too condescending. Um, and he told parables, really, about post-war poverty with an implied or implicit uplifting moral. Bunuel was intent, instead, uh, to go straight into the depths of the human condition and not to expect to rise above it. At Cannes, Miracle in Milan delighted everybody, while Bunuel simply shocked them. And De Sica, who was basking in very good feelings, having, having won, the, won the grand prize, um, seems to have been turned off by Los Olvidados, which he saw there. And he asked Bunuel quite directly what horrible thing had happened to him when he was young to give him such an implacably bleak view of life. Didn't he have a mother who cared for him? <laughs> Although he had liked Shusha, uh, Bunuel had little in common with De Sica. He obeyed a creed different from that of the socially conscious neorealism. His creed stemmed from a surrealism that is untethered by reason, morality, or censorship. So Los Alvidados, we'll have to discuss this afterwards, it has a lot in common with neorealism, but Bunuel was insistent that it was something different, that he was way closer to surrealism. He's not going to be held back by the grimmest implications of its premise. How did Bunuel win that prize? So I've been thinking about it because uh, today it may not seem to surprise us quite as much uh, because provocation can be a lure to festival directors. Look at Lars von Trier at Cannes, for instance. Breaking the wave came didn't it, just after the Dogma 95 manifesto. Um, or look at the Berlin Festival, your own festival, nearly, nearly your own, uh, in 2021, which handed its best film award to bad luck banging or lo loony porn. Talk about bad taste. Uh, Radu Jude could claim to be following in Bunuel's footsteps, though there's a difference, one that Bazan and Truffaut would have understood right away, because Los Alvidados may be nasty, but it's never cynical in my view. Bunuel is careful to hold himself up for exposure, even as he looks into the filthiest recesses of Mexico City. True, he did begin as a provocateur. No question about that. I'm going to give you some more images quickly of uh, Miracle in Milan, because I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, not much, but these are from, this is the sentimentality of Miracle in Milan. It's, it is filmed in a ghetto, the houses are knocked down, but in the end, the characters get to ride off above the great cathedral and carry everyone with them. So it's a, it's a wonderful film, but it wasn't to Benwell's taste. But so uh, he began with Lage d'Or. Gaston Modo walking the streets of Paris deliberately click, uh, kicks a blind man in a manner quite similar to a scene in Bad Luck Banging. And you're going to see a similar scene in uh, Los Olvidados with a blind man being uh, the victim of, um, of people who are, who are sighted. In Las Hurdas, Land Without Blood, voice, the, the voiceover makes fun of the Cretans that the camera uh, shows as having. Uh, blank stares and just uh, uh, grotesque faces, really. Similar faces populate Los Olvidados. This is, this is the roughness of Los Olvidados. You'll be seeing plenty of this. But, uh, and these are faces from Las Herdas. And then 15 years later, from Los Olvidados. Bazan finds that Bunuel's gaze upon the saddest derelicts is a loving gaze, and he finds beauty in the human, even deformed though it may be. That doesn't mean that he believes there to be good, kind souls within the worst of characters. That includes virtually everybody in the movie you're going to see. 
As Truffaut says, Bunuel is a skeptic through and through. He believes in no one's self-conception. People dupe themselves and others, but they don't dupe Bunuel. He found life amusing and was most amused when stripped of its moral trappings. He's an optimistic artist, Truffaut says. And this is one of the, I don't know if this is a personal statement or if you can sense it in the filmmaking itself. This is the hardest film to find this in it. But Truffaut said, when it's not a question of smugness, but of transcending pessimism, an optimistic artist is always the greater. He's better than the nihilist. That's Truffaut's view. So Bonwell's an optimist who deals with the worst of things. At the time of his interview, Truffaut was formulating his not notorious attack on the French cinema of quality, lacerating precisely the smugness and facile pessimism of Yves Allegre, including uh, a film, Les Orgueilleux, scripted by Sartre, uh, and another film, uh, Against Capital Punishment, these, these tough, tough films of the cinema of quality. Truffaut hated those kinds of films. He hated psychological realism, but he loved films that startled one with the unexpected. The anti-psychological Bunuelian scenario, scenario, he said, functions on the same principle as a hot and cold shower. This is Truffaut. It alternates favorable and unfavorable signs, reason, and nonsense. Anti-bourgeois, anti-conformist, he is as sarcastic as Stroheim, but he has a lighter touch. His worldview is subversive, and he's happily anarchist. Truffaut immediately put Bunuel among his top directors alongside Renoir, Bergman, Nicholas Ray, Hitchcock, Lubitsch, and Rossellini. And it's true, Bunuel's characters connive and fight for what they can get. They operate by instinct, like those insects that he so wanted to film and that he puts in his films frequently. But you can love insects and you can care about them, whether in the contortions they go through to stay alive individually or in their group solidarity, which is just the survival instinct that's been raised up a level. And he thinks human beings are a kind of social instinct. Uh, in, we have the instincts of insects. Uh, we don't use them as well, he thinks. Rossellini for whom Truffaut worked as an assistant in 1954 is an especially apt comparison because both he and Bunuel, like Bresson, made no secret of their imp the impact of their Catholicism. This is... Because La Salvedadas frames individuals and then pairs in small groups, it feels closer to Rossellini's Flowers of St. Francis than to Bunuel's Diary of a Country Priest. It's got a, both films of groups in them. Um, and uh, people have not made this comparison. I hope this is a good one, if you've seen the film. I just saw it, so it's been on my mind, the Rossellini film. Because Rossellini, like Brisson, was an avant-garde filmmaker in Bazin's sense. And uh, Le Journal de Cure de Campagna and Los Olvidados, um, uh, just like the Flowers of St. Francis, dispensed with actors. To film the flowers, Rossellini enticed monks from a Franciscan monastery to take on roles in imitation of their predecessors, the very first Franciscans back in the 13th century. Well, they couldn't fail. Why? I mean, imitating St. Francis was, in fact, their mission. That's what they signed up for. So they were really good at it. Uh, and he also was able to film them sur place, right there in the south of Italy. Shooting began late in January 1950, just a month before Bunuel shot Los Olvidados. These films were in sync, I, I believe. St. Francis screened at Venice in autumn 1950, a month before Los Alvidados' disastrous initial showing in Mexico. Bazan and Truffaut would have seen them simultaneously when they, opened the, when they came to Paris, since St. Fra uh, Francis opened in Paris on March 7, 1951, a month before Los Alvidados was screened at Cannes. Rossellini's film is the blessed rural complement to Bunuel's urban tale of the forgotten ones, the damned ones. The rough-hewn look of both, the tattered appearance of those living in poverty and subject, as here, to bad weather, as well as some bad people around them, give them a similar texture. Importantly, this cinema of poverty, as I will coin a phrase, <laughs> is unredeemed by artistic photography. Bunuel's insistence on harsh documentary lighting and medium shots that refuse the satisfactions of balanced framing or the incursion, inclusion of interesting background elements infuriated his photographer, the legendary Gabriel Figueroa, who complained bitterly to his producer. Figueroa and he and Bunuel had terrible arguments, and Bunuel would not, he kept taking apart his compositions, saying it's too pretty, it looks too good. Um, and Figaro had just, I've been working on Graham Greene and his films, he just finished The Fugitive with uh, John Ford's version of Power and the Glory. Gorgeous shots of very poor rural 
um, Mexico. But uh, Benoit would have nothing of it. He had to situate his camera in the midst of an undistinguished garbage heap of a ghetto. That's what Benoit said. Rossellini didn't need to change his style much. It's a journalistic style, and he had used it already and recently in Paisa and Germany or Zero. With a France, St. Francis film, he told his cameraman to emulate the simplicity of his subject, St. Francis himself. And simplicity, the bare appearance of the human, governs both the flowers of Francis and Los Olvidados. Both advance in a kind of picaresque style or fashion. Fellini and Rossellini composed the, the script of Flowers of St. Francis as a dozen modestly interlinked incidents chosen from the 53 that are recounted in a very famous anonymous 14th century uh, uh, collection book. Like Bunuel's anti-hero Haibo, St. Francis is certainly, as here, seen as the community's leader, but he doesn't absorb all the screen time. That honor goes to the uh, beloved and lovable <laughs> and rather naive Hinepro, whose adventures involve his confrontation with a notorious warrior of ridiculous proportions uh, and a delightful aged fool. The silliness of the friars uh, lays open some, the, uh, uh, excuse me, lays open uh, human beings, qualities in human beings, which are quite the same, except in a different uh, emotional register, uh, to the youths that are filmed by Bunuel, in a very straightforward fashion, they're filmed. Both directors are part, Bazan says, of a new avant-garde that doesn't need or wish to show off what this art form can bring to reality. Rather, they want to see what realities can come, uh, come to light through this bare machinery. Nothing could get in the way of the viewer's perception, uh, perception of these behaviors. No message or moral or reproach. Both directors point us, along with their cameras, at situations of bare life. Just see and learn, Rosalini said. They both would say that. This is what we can be. We can be cruel or kind. There's the beatific uh, uh, St. Francis on the right coming to meet the leper on the left in one of the great episodes of the film. There they are. So stare straight into the face of what is almost difficult to look at. Unsurprisingly, Saint Flower, uh, Flowers of St. Francis was also included in Cahiers' top 10 films of the year. Now there's one other film uh, that was unavoidable at the time of the, the critics surrounding Bazin and Cahiers uh, stood, stood in front of, or were thinking about uh, Los Olvidados. It stood at the very top, the number one film of the year for Cahiers de Cinema was The River, Jean Renoir. So this one looks a little different. <laughs> Expensive, in color. Uh, it opened a month after Los Olvidados in France. And Bazin wrote his tremendous reviews um, of the river on December 27th of 1951, and he wrote on Los Alvidados on January 7th, a week and a half later. Both directors would become close friends of Bazin's, dining at his home and later sitting more than once for interviews with him and Truffaut, who, who was at those dinners. Both loved food, drink, and talk, yet how different their sensibilities. The river in particular seems at the antipodes of, um, of Los Alvidados. It's an expensive technicolor film. It's taken from a moralizing novel by a woman reflecting on her adolescence in a privileged home with loving parents. What has this to do with Los Alvidados? Well, I will only point to Renoir's desire in leaving Hollywood definitively behind to find something essential about the human condition. And he insisted on shooting on location in Bengal. His upper crust tale had to be acted out in sight of the stark poverty visible in Claude Renoir's stunning photography. His documentary shots, really, there, there were quite a few of them, many more than are in the film, taken along the Ganges. Bunuel didn't need to cross to the other side of the world to find life at a minimum. He just crossed the other side of Mexico City, a side that he had never really been filmed before, as he did. As for the river's tale of lost innocence, Bunuel must have appreciated the shots. These are the documentary type shots. But then there's a, 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 at least one sequence that I'm sure Benoit would have loved, or did love, if, I'm sure he saw it, the faker who coaxes a cobra out of the box to fascinate little Bogey and his Bengali playmate. Benoit loved boxes, and he loved dangerous things. The cobra would have been top on his list. And little Bogey is fascinated by it the way we are fascinated by what's in the movie box, according to Benoit, and he dies because of it. Benoit would have laughed at that, too. 
Bazin wrote of Renoir's Franciscan piety, which makes room for snakes as well as birds, and which is but a step removed from the pagan reverence and respect for everything on earth, the abject as well as the comely. Now, Bunuel had always aimed to go straight at the abject, like Georges Bataille, who was one of his mentors from his early surrealist days. Bataille's story of the eye came out in 1927. It's got a famous scene, by the way, of uh, an egg and an eyeball. I don't have time to go into it, but um, this will appear in a guy's version in the film you'll see tonight a bit. Whether it's from that story, I'm not sure. And Chien and Deleuze came the following year, containing his notorious scene of the eyeball slitting, which you can close your eyes for, but I'll just quickly run through this most famous of all openings. That was Bunuel, that is Bunuel, with the razor, slitting the eyeball. The next, next came his famous text, Le Gros Otai, the, the big toenail, big toe. <laughs> um, and this is Boifard's famous surrealist shot that was in Document, one of the very first issues of Document Bataille's magazine in 1928. Bataille said this about it. Maybe we can talk about body parts after, <laughs> afterwards because there's a whole set of hands, eyeballs, toes, um, and mouths that are in Bunuel's film from beginning to end. I haven't watched Los Avidados with that in view, but I'm going to this time. There's also the, um, the shot of the woman's hairy under armpit, which is matched to a close-up of a sea urchin, an ursin. Okay. And look at this. This is L'Age d'Or, the big toe, this time, being filleted by an aroused woman, just the year after. Bunuel returned to Spain after L'Age d'Or, and in 1932 he began to, to, to film the ethnographic um, uh, Las Hurdas. This is a film that was also ran into censorship trouble. The, the, the film Lodge Door, this shot, was not seen by anybody after it's about five screenings and it was closed down and nobody saw it again for years and years and decades. But Las Hurtas was also shut down by, first of all, the Republican or more leftist government, and then, of course, by Franco as soon as uh, his government took, his military took over the government later on. So that was also a film that was difficult to see and for different reasons. This is from Lodge Door, another eyeball coming from Bataille. That turns into the eye of the ethnographer, in my view. Bunuel was cast out of filmmaking, really, after this film. Uh, he, was, he was accursed, he was Modi. He had to beg for scraps of hack work in those different film industries I've already mentioned. So is La Salvidadas a surrealist film or had been well changed since L'Age d'Or? Bazin equivocated. He effectively de demoted the historical avant-garde films of the 20s, but he made exception of Bunuel. He said, well, his films are okay. Those early 20 ones are really too shishi. Uh, but he recognized him as a, as a genuine poet of cinema. And here's what he said. I'm inclined to think that Bunuel has given us the only contemporary aesthetic proof of Freudianism. Surrealism used it in too conscious a fashion for one to be surprised at finding it in its painting symbols, which it put there in the first place. You can't be surprised by what you see in, in their paintings because they put them there. They put stuff there. Only in Chien and and Lage d'Or and Los Olvidados present us with the psychoanalytic situations in their profound and irrefragable truth. This is Bazin. Whatever the concrete form which Bunuel gives to the dream, and here most questionably, his images have a pulsating, burning power to move us. The thick blood of the unconscious circulates in them and swamps us as from an open artery with a pulsing of the spirit. It says, nous inonde comme par une artère ouverte au rhythm de l'esprit. What Bazin disliked in the first avant-garde was its elitism, as I've mentioned. And so he embraced Los Alvidados both as a genuinely Freudian expression, Bazin had been a practicing surrealist in the early 40s, and as an adult look 
for a wider audience, made to be seen by a wider, uh, by a wider, uh, a man with a wider view, made to be seen uh, by by a wider audience. And he was in court with the director himself, who had officially broken with Breton before making Las Hurtas in 1932. Uh, so there are two steps from the Lage d'Or and um, the works with Salvador Dali to he breaks with surrealism um, over the Communist Party, really, and and what he thinks of as their narrow view of things. Boswell says explicitly, I was beginning not to agree with the surrealist kind of intellectual aristocracy with its moral and artistic extremes, which isolated us from the world and limited us to our own company. Surrealists considered the majority of mankind contemptible or stupid, and so they withdrew from all social participation or responsibility and shunned the works of others. And so he moved on to an ethnographic study, which would put him in contact with the world. And this was first in these two steps with Las Hurdas, Land Without Bread, and then Los Alvidados, which I'm definitely not the first person to have shown this tremendous connection between these two, but there are, there are differences. He had to accommodate himself first to the um, feature-length film as opposed to this shorter version, 28 minutes. And he moved past what I think of as the adolescent cynicism of Las Hurdas, Land Without Bread, which maintains a kind of self-satisfaction in the objectivity of the, of the voiceover, um, where the deliberate rejection of pity took on the color of a kind of aesthetic provocation. It's a pitiless film, and it makes fun of the people that it's looking at. Very hard to watch or to show to students. Where do you? Um, you I, have we seen it? Yeah. OK, sorry. You know what I'm, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but now we have Los Alvidados, which, on the contrary, is a film of love and one which demands love. I was uh, quoting uh, Bazan through a lot of that. Love is a word that comes up a lot when Bazan writes about De Sica, too. But Bunuel's love of life, of the world, and of man is never sentimental. Miracle in Milan was heartwarming enough to spawn what is often derided or called rosy, uh, it's not really a good translation, but rosy neorealism. Nothing is ever rosy in Bunuel. He gapes into the maw of uh, humanity that he did not believe was reformable or even at base particularly good. And Bunuel was determined to film man at his basest. He does so under the imprimatur of Georges Bataille and of anthropology as much as art. Like Bataille's closest collaborator, uh, Michel Leris, and at precisely the same moment, and I, uh, I should go back to this one, uh, this is Las Hurdas, at precisely the same moment, 1931 to 33, Bunuel had left Paris and surrealism to explore the primitive, and Leris had come back from um, uh, the, the famous Dakar to Djibouti um, trip where he was secretary, right, having written L'Afrique Fantôme. Both were decidedly unconventional works, ethnography rubbing up against something larger. Le problème de l'homme, as Bunuel put it, the problem of man. Adam Lowenstein um, goes further, suggesting that Bunuel, Leris, and their mentor Bataille were striving for something beyond Lum, something post-human in the relations they all explored between humans and animals. The key relation for all of these was crystallized in the bullfight. Now you'll find animals throughout Los Alvidados. I hope we make a little catalog at the end. But uh, Lowenstein wants us to focus on the first one that is evoked in the film, that this shot, this shot of the boys taking on the role of a bull and matador with a camera at times placed it in the charging point of view of the animal. And soon the delinquents are going to charge Carmelo, the blind guy, as if he were a bull. So Bataille and Leris were both, um, uh, are both implicated here. Bataille, because the story of the eye includes the gruesome des description of a bullfight that Bunuel never forgot. And Leris, because he made bullfighting a lifelong passion, he published uh, his Miroir de la uh, Tachomachie in 1938, and he wrote the script in 1948 for the film Bullfight in, uh, I guess he wrote it in 1949. Uh, the film came out in 1951, and Bazan wrote one of his greatest essays on this film about bullfighting called Death Every Afternoon. And he wrote that essay just at the same moment that these films were coming out. Even more important, uh, there's a sur pertinent surrealist ethnography was coming into light just at this moment. Bazan and everyone attending the Biarritz Festival, first this is the, you can, you can still see this film. Um, in the Biarritz Festival of Film Modi, 
One of the greatest revelations was the very first film, very first screening, as far as I know, of a film by Jean Rouche, La Circoncision, 1949. It, it was highly discussed. Rouche would later be excoriated for treating, and by Usman Zemben, the great African, most famous of all African directors, as treating Africans like insects. Most people sided with the Afri have sided with the African filmmaker over the Frenchman in this debate. But Bunuel, we have seen, would gladly have confessed to this sin, having wanted to become an entomologist himself before he took up cinema. So it may be worth comparing Los Olvidados to Rouche's Les Maîtres Fou. Both are sublime expressions of the other that is in us, that, that we are. Bazin approved the vigor of Bunuel's dark vision, especially when, when compared to what he felt was the sniveling, self-pitying narcissism of post-war philosophy. He writes, nothing is more opposed to existentialist pessimism than Bunuel's cruelty, because it evades nothing, it concedes nothing, and it dares to dissect reality with surgical obscenity. It can rediscover man and all his greatness and force by a sort of Pascalian dialectic into love and admiration. That's Bazin again, this dialectic. You look at the worst, and it means that you're, you love what you look at. You, you believe in it somehow. When humans are at their nadir, when the most hideous face belongs to those who behave atrociously, Homo Sacher is revealed uh, in all its revolutionary potential. Rossellini had Francis kiss what was left of the le leper's face. I don't know if you can see him. You can't, it's too dark a slide. Bazan finds Bunuel doing the same with his urchins, not to save them, but to recognize himself and all of us to be the same as they. Rossellini was accused of or praised for, quote, turning spirituality into a manner of instinct, filming a group of people whose actions were truly their thought, their sole mode of being. While Francis was a precursor to Giulietta Massina's character in La Strada, and Pasolini adored Rossellini's Francis, uh, Francis film, and I think his acatone owed it, owes it a great deal. So there's a whole tradition of trying that I think starts at this moment, and Bunuel is part of it, and I think St. Francis is in it as well. Rossellini's St. Francis has been sanctified, if that's the word, by reference to Giotto, and certain of its compositions are, um, are clearly, well, you know, seem to model, I'll show you, I think I've got one slide here that shows you something in the arena chapel where you can imagine it in the film. Bunuel, however, emulated no model. Nevertheless, his act of painting the cruelty of man and the world had plenty of precedent in his Spanish background. And Bazan ends his essay this way. The taste for the horrible, the sense of cruelty, the seeking out of extreme aspects of life, these are the heritage of Goya, Zuberin, and Ribera, of a whole tragic sense of humanity which these painters have displayed precisely in expressing the most extreme human degradation, that of war, sickness, poverty, and its rot rotten accessories. But their cruelty, too, is no more than the measure of their trust in mankind and in painting. So here, for instance, is the Giotto shot, I would say, something like it. And here's what Bazan must have been referring to when he was thinking of Bunuel's relationship to Goya, to cruelty. to Nightmare, Zubran's St. Francis, and Zubran's dissection of, of martyrdom. There is at least one shot in, uh, we shouldn't have put this in, but in uh, Las Hurtas, which is some people have mentioned as there's a kind of pieta, but the woman's re being really shown to, because of the goiter in her throat. Let's see what time it is. Okay, I think I've probably gone uh, long enough. I, I want to at least mention though the last, um, I'll just th run through these couple of these images that show Bunuel and Dali's total familiarity with the history of painting and the use of it in their early films. He gets away from it, but it, it, although even in the shot of the famous shot of the cow on the bed, I think is related to the rape of Europa. <laughs> They knew these paintings intimately and talked about them sometimes. So this is this is the abject. Okay, um, so I will conclude just by mentioning, but not uh, spending more time going into it, something which 
has been a, a treat for me to learn about in preparing for this. Uh, and that is the relationship of, um, of Bunuel and this film to Octavio Paz. Okay. So here's what happened. I'll just present the finale of the um, of the introduction that uh, well, the finale of this introduction by trying to set us back in Cannes in April 1951. It actually starts a couple of months before when Bunuel's film was completely dismissed by everybody, including his own cast and crew, some of them, uh, in November, he went to Paris. He wrote a Museum of Modern Art where he had worked. He wrote Henri Langlois in Paris, the head of the Cinémathèque Française. He didn't get much response from either of them about trying to re resurrect something. They didn't, hadn't seen the film. But he got a, a screening of, by his friends in December of 1950 when he arrived in Paris. They showed the film. And Octavio Paz writes about it. Paz was the Mexican cultural attaché to France. And he met regularly with Breton and Elward. And he heard about Bunuel, of course. He knew that he was in Mexico. And he wrote his most famous book, The Labyrinth of Solitude, El Labyrinto de la Soledad, uh, in 1950, just before, while Bunuel was just putting his film together. He was on his mind. And I could go into the, the if you read the first essay, particularly on the uh, Pachuco and the Los Angeles Mexican, you'll see where Bunuel had just come from Los Angeles and that Mexican part of LA, uh, and was definitely going to have read that, that essay. So he was able to see Paz. Paz went to the screening, and there he said he found that there were two uh, factions. On one side, you could see the old surrealist friends, particularly um, Breton and his wife. Uh, and on the other side were the communists, former surrealists. And that included Louis Aragon, but also Georges Sadoul, a great critic, who became a tremendous Bunuel supporter. But they divided on the film. The communists said, there's not enough Marxism in it. Uh, they, it was predictable. And you make the policemen look too good. Uh, whereas Breton said, this is the best thing I've seen in a long time. <laughs> uh, so pause then went on a mad scramble to try to get the film shown at Cannes because the Mexican government had no interest in seeing, having it shown anywhere. It thought the film was a... a um, so let me see if I can... I'll just... Yeah, let's see. Um, okay, yeah, this is the end here. I realized that one of the greatest films of the time, it was one of the greatest films of the time, and that with it, Bunuel had resumed the extraordinary work he had begun with his greatest surrealist films of Lodge Door and Chien and Delo. I found several friends who disinterestedly devoted themselves to making Los Alvedados the film of the festival. First of all, we visited Jacques Prévert, who lived nearby, and who behaved wonderfully. We got the collaboration of Cocteau and Chagall. We also mobilized journalists, secretaries, etc. 24 hours uh, before this festival started, we distributed the text that, uh, that I wrote. And he wrote a wonderful review of the film. Finally, uh, Don Seguer, the producer, showed up at the last minute. Although he was late, he was effective. And then came Jacques Prévert's poem, which he wrote just for, for the occasion, bringing it over to Cannes. My last slide is of that poem. It's Los Olvidados. And I don't have time to, to read it, and I, um, but it's a beautiful uh, homage to the, to the film. J'ai vu Bunuel avant hier soir à Cannes. De très loin et de très près, il n'est pas changé. Louis Bunuel n'est pas montreur uh, d'ombre. And he goes on and talks about uh, Olvidados, los Olvidados, quand on ne connaît pas la langue, on croirait à des arbres heureux. Los Olvidados, des plantes ou des oliviers. Los Olvidados, petites plantes. Erranto said, Faubourg de Mexico City. Goes on and is a glorious poem. The film was acclaimed at the festival. He got the Best Director Award, which has allowed it to live on ever after. So put yourself in 1951 in, uh, in April. And, and now we'll have a chance to do what I think is most important, which is to think about Bunuel not as surrealist, not as ethnographer, not as poet, 
but as film man. He was always a cinema person. And I haven't talked really about that, because you have to see the film to do that. So we're going to see the film, and let's see what he does in, in cinema. People loved it, and let's see if, it's, if it holds up. Thank you. But let's get into uh, talking about the film. One thing I forgot to say in the introduction, which Dudley wanted me to say, uh, is he actually has a book coming out very soon, uh, a very short introduction to French film. Uh, There's a whole series of these short introductions from Oxford. Uh, is it Oxford or Oxford University Press? Uh, so do keep your eyes out for that. Uh, but let's get into... Um, Los Ovidados. Uh, one thing maybe I wanted to bring up uh, to kick things off is the Truffaut connection. I was really fascinated uh, to see that uh, there was a the Truffaut really felt a kind of uh, a, a great interest in the film, and it seems to me that there's both uh, autobiographical then links to Truffaut's own life, who he himself had a kind of delinquent upbringing where there's a kind of absent, let's say absence of parental affection uh, and then pa possibly also uh, an influence of the film on Truffaut's first film, The 400 Blows, which is, seems to actually have some interesting parallels with Floss over that is. So given you, your own interest in Truffaut, um, yeah. what would you say to that? Well, this would get me off on a longer <laughs> subject about Truffaut, but it is uh, quite remarkable. I had forgotten so much of it till you just reminded me now. But Truffaut not only... Um, was adopted by Bazin, taken from a delinquent's home where he was in jail, effectively, and brought to his house. As he was, Bazin became his legal guardian uh, for several years. But uh, when Truffaut was making 400 blows, he was having trouble trying to figure out how to both end the film and how to deal with the psychologist scene. There's a famous psychologist scene where um, Jean-Pierre Léo just talks directly to the camera, effectively, well, off to a, a, a voice, which is... Um, you don't see the psychologist asking, asking him questions. He got that uh, strategy, which is really famous strategy now, uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Fernand Le uh, Deligny, who's become an extremely well-known now uh, educator, a radical educator, and who was living next to Bazin at the time that Bazin uh, decided to adopt Truffaut. So I'm positive that... Uh, because Bazin, Bazin knew Deligny, who was working as a, in the communist organization, a work in culture, and helped him get films. And Deligny must have told him, "Yeah, you ought to take this kid on. He's such a he's he's just he likes films the way you do." So then Truffaut went back on Bazin's advice to, to talk to Deligny about how to deal with um, troubled children, because that's what Deligny did day to day. He worked with uh, autistic children and uh, really troubled children, and he had a very wild strategy. Uh, to help um, restore their lives. And Deligny suggested how to do both the psychologist scene, and he said at the end, just have him run. Just, it's, and Deligny's the one that actually coined the term uh, nomadism <laughs> from that, uh, that uh, Deleuze and Guattari, if you follow modern French intellectual history, uh, those terms come from Deligny. Um, and, uh, and then he went on to make films about troubled children himself, one of which... Cocteau got shown at Cannes in 1970, and Truffaut actually helped sponsor the film. So there's a long connection between Truffaut delinquency and attempts to rehabilitate children through para-institutional means. Uh, the difference is that Truffaut had a much more optimistic view, I think, of the possibilities of um, reform. Um, and uh, Bonuel does not uh, have any, uh, you can tell me what you think, but uh, I don't think he, he believes that the, the institutions are really going to go anywhere, despite the opening sequence. I'd like to know what you think about the opening sequence, um, which people don't talk about very much, the one that shows the Eiffel Tower and there are troubled kids in, in every major capital of the world, and, uh, but we've got ways of society needs to make them better. Um, why does he start that after he hit, hit, at least he said, I'm going to make a film without any compromise. Um, it'll be a, a rough film. But he begins uh, like a pretty standard um, film about the amelioration of society's problems through social engineering. <laughs> Did, is, I yeah. is this a way to get away with what he then does? <laughs> it's like, oh, this is a... 
This is a salutary film after all. I don't know. Vincent's maybe has a... Uh, no, I mean, the, o- the opening position. feels like an endorsement of the, of, of the welfare state model. Yeah. Um, and, and it f- feels like it was put there to sort of alleviate what, what follows. But it's, it's sort of a reverse um, condit uh, thing where the optimistic <laughs> message comes at the beginning and then he sets out <laughs> to completely destroy the idea of the workability of the welfare state. Um, he, he d- yeah. In Marxist literature, there is in Engels' book um, about the condition of the working class in England, there's a description how Engels arrives in the port of London and he describes how much he is impressed about the splendors and the many boats and sails which he sees in London. And then he describes also that when um, he penetrated into the city, then he would see the quarters of the poor people in London, and he would also describe that there are poor quarters in London, but there are also wealthy quarters where the poor people would be hidden in in the backyards. So seeing London right in the beginning, it reminded me of that text of Engels, and I would trust that Buñuel knows it, but then he follows up with Paris and with other places. That's my idea about it. But do you think he then would have had the idea to try to show some wealthier quarters? The only thing we see that's uh, at all civilized, actually, are the institutions, which are, well, except for the farm, well, at least the, the courthouse and so on, is kind of but not forbidding. It's just so official. What we do see, though, is the construction site, and that looks like it's building a tower block or some kind of, you know, a, a kind of edifice of modern uh, civilization almost, that this is going to be... Uh, a kind of way uh, of using concrete to uh, kind of solve social issues, let's say, just kind of sweep away the slums and they replace no, them. They, they, definitely, they definitely did it. Um, <laughs> they do it in every city. You're right. This is, you can go see that building now, and it's, it was a building going up. This is part of the big modernization. Well, it's 19, late 40s. They're building lots of things in many countries, probably right here, right? <laughs> uh, Starting to build new buildings and taking away the slums, so that's true. Uh, you're going to see that happen. So I'm sure he built, he showed that on purpose, um, but it doesn't show any wealthy quarters. It doesn't show. Um, it, this is really the is almost sub proletariat where these people are living. Um, there's also the issue of the the gag. I mean, Bunuel did like uh, gags. He was a big fan of comedies. And gags are, you know, you set up, so he sets up, maybe setting up a gag, you know. Um, it's not so different from what was said at first about uh, putting the, uh, the the nice message at the end of a tough film. This one says, oh, it lures you in to thinking this is going to be another social documentary, of, and of which there were many, you can imagine, after World War II, this is, and during the war, and, um, this is the way the new world is going to be built, everything's going to be okay. And then he just rubs your face in it. He, he sucks you into the film, makes you comfortable, and then makes you very uncomfortable. But, I mean, this uh, the opening also links the film to Las Ordes, where there's the kind of the voiceover, but that has this ironic edge to it. Although this voice doesn't have an ironic edge, but the no, but the film the gives it an ironic yeah, edge. That's correct. Really. Yeah, um, I think that's right. Yeah, this, I also notice in the opening credits, there's this kind of the imprimatur of a. Doctor, who I assume is a kind of developmental child psychologist or something. Of, um, well, I don't know if you know anything well, more about Well, just that Benoit was very proud of the research he did. Um, you know, for a film, it was he got $2,000 to make this film total. Um, and it consumed a lot of his time. Uh, but he really went uh, He went and lived in that area for he really worked in to try to find the habits of the people, how they worked, where they lived. I'm not sure he chose the... I mean, people like the way he chose the actors in a way, but they are actors, and I think the, there is a, uh, some contradictions in his idea that everything he said is true, but only uh, uh, Ojitos, the little eyes, was a non-actor. Everybody else in there had played in movies before, and so he's got people playing um, the prolet- sub-proletarians, <laughs> but he, I think, did 
want to uh, give it give it to you the way it was visually in the Cartier, and then he also spent a lot of time in that very institution that you see them in at the end, going through police files and looking at the stories of kids. And there was a, a there was a story of such that you saw uh, that he read that it became the basis of it. Um, so he, yeah, he was happy about that. So he would have been interested in talking to psychologists and so on, even though he as at least he claims to, and Bazan and Truffaut and everybody else, he was anti-psychological. He didn't think people could really help each other through their, <laughs> through the talking cure or anything else. Vincent. Yeah, if, if I may pick up on a few threads. Uh, the Engels text belongs to a Victorian genre of people going slumming, you know, uh, going to see how the subproletarian live. And it's basically done to shock the the better off into social action and uh, you know create a social conscience and get them get people to do something about it and one of the outcomes of the slumming aesthetic of course is the, is the the vision of the garden city in in modernity where um, you do away with slums and everyone has their little garden and and basically works in a park city and what what, uh, what what's remarkable about Buñuel, and I think you worked this, you you pointed this out in your talk with the reference to the Saint Francis figure, um, is that in a way Buñuel also breaks with the slumming aesthetic. This is not a film that goes slumming. He does not go there to be shocked by the way these people live or to shock us through the way uh, these people live. But what he goes in search of is the dignity of the people. And and that is a very different kind of approach from what I think Engels was, was, was into. Um, one of the remarkable things about the film is how clean the Spanish is these actors speak. There's no slang. It's... it's uh, I mean, uh, other people in this room might have a better command of Spanish than I do, but it's a very standard and very clean and very intelligible um, uh, uh, form of Spanish. Actually, sort of a stage acting um, uh, Spanish. If you if you shot a film like that in Naples and actors would speak Italian the way these people speak Spanish, it would be completely ridiculous. So it's there's an element of artificiality and uh, which in in the in the way the the actors speak that I think contributes to the the break with the slumming aesthetic. Um, that's it. that's not been pointed out. That's very interesting to uh, to hear, and I can I can believe it. Um, and it would it, it would it would takes me back to the Octavio Paz f first essay and. Um, in the Labyrinth of Solitude about the Pachuco in Los Angeles and the style of clothes, their, the attempt of the Pachuco to be hated by, to be victimized by the society that uh, they feel already at the bottom of and therefore to be kind of martyr heroes. Uh, but he talks about style, mainly in clothes, but he also talks about language, the kind of language that they adopt. It's uh, both Spanish and, and I don't know, I have to go back to that essay, but. Um, that they would try to f make a sub, kind of a subgroup through language, which doesn't happen in this film, evidently. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Dudley, I wanted to ask about the character of Heibel. Uh, I mean, you could you described him as an anti-hero in the film, but for, I don't think I could name many characters who seem to have a more purely demonic presence in a film than Haibo. I mean, he really is this kind of pure force of evil in the film, to my mind at least. I don't know what your reaction... But, or, I mean, or, almost Mephistophelian in the way also he has this ability to materialise uh, at many moments in the scene, at exactly the wrong moment usually, and just kind of emerge from the shadows or from out of the, let's say, from out of the or champ uh, of the... Of the filmic image, I don't know. What, what was no, your well, response for, to how Heibel? Well, 
Well, first about the script writing. It it really is well written and, and the coordinated. Let's just say that because it's true. He does show up whenever you think things are could go a different way. There he is. And the last one in particular. Let's say he's right outside as uh, as Pedro is getting out, going through the gates and getting out to go spend the get the change for the director. There he is. But but he has been led there. You just saw minutes before, a minute and a half before that. Um, that the mother has told him that he's in the, the camp and he's, he's going he's gonna to go and check on his own welfare and make sure the kid isn't ratting on him. So there's a reason for him to be there, but it's true. He's all by himself. The first person, the, the, it's like meeting your worst enemy. He is waiting, meeting his worst enemy uh, in his one moment of trying to go straight. So yeah, there's that script aspect of it, which I think is really well done. Because um, it's a short film, but there's a reason for him to kind of pop up. And it's not that big a place. You know, it's a small area that they're in. It only takes place in a week, by the way, if you think about it, go through it. Um, second, then, is about Haibo's own character. I, I'll just say this, that the film ends with him getting a dream. It's amazing. Uh, so I, you know, why would that be? He gives him, I guess, enough subjectivity to have him die uh, with, with his own dream on the world's world screens. <laughs> so either it, it shows that this is not only Pedro's film um, and that everybody has an interior. It also shows that we're all alone going down the black hole. I mean, it's a very depressing final moment for Bunuel. <laughs> it's also the, the whole of sleep. Um, Bunuel loved dreams, as everybody knows. He loved to go to sleep. Couldn't wait to see what would happen next, including nightmares. Um, and he gets that, but it also may be part of the surrealist uh, belief in the objectivity of dreams. I mean, you say you can't understand how another person feels. How can you understand what another person dreams? But, but Bunuel and the surrealists at least thought that was you were just as likely to have to be able to live and discuss your dreams objectively as you could otherwise. So he puts these two dreams on the screen of these two characters who become who, who die because of each other. Um, so anyway, I'm just saying that he gets, uh, you're right, he is horribly demonic, but Bunuel gives him a kind of stature. He does have, um, he, I don't know, can you say he has dignity? Because he does every dirty trick there can be, and yet he holds himself with uh, you know, such a demeanor uh, and swagger. That it's he's extremely charismatic he's, he uh, is. He's on, the, on the screen. Uh, he's seductive, uh, I think, for the viewer as well as for Pedro's mother. Uh, which brings another element of the, obviously into the film. Uh, there is, of course, the moment you have sympathy for. Well, there, there's a moment you question yourself because you know, in the scene with the mother, he talks about how he never had any parents. He's, you know, he gives the whole. You see the kind of social uh, context that created someone like Heiber. On the other hand, there's also the question in your mind: Is he just manipulating her as well? You know, is this just another one of his ruses? It's, uh, is he this way because he's because he is big and charismatic, yeah. and he and human beings like insects. The bigger one is going to dominate the others. I think Bunuel has that in him to say, this is what happens in in groups when there's no, uh, you know, if they're uncoordinated, they will coordinate themselves under certain in certain laws that the cinema is there to both document and to provoke uh, in some respects. So, um, yeah, he. He is, uh, he's got his lusts. He's, the first thing you know is that he's got hunger. The very first thing he asks for is uh, he wants that sandwich. The very first thing is hunger. And so the film is about hunger. I mean, when Wall says, yeah, it's about hunger, but it's about uh, the hunger. Well, actually, this is Octavio Paz. It's the hunger um, for, uh, I guess, for su sustenance, for warmth. Um, something that makes you feel better. It's, and the look, the the desire for the mother, uh, which is, you know, taken to incestual <laughs> aspects in this film, perhaps, but um, he, he, that's what he wants. And the, the food fills you up. You want a home to be with. You want a mother to, you know, warm you. And he doesn't have those things, and he's going for them as uh, strongly as he can. Uh, Questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah. I must admit, I have seen this film the first time tonight. And uh, I mean, this is a film from 1950. But watching the film, I couldn't stop rem 
remembering scenes from other films which were made much more later, for example, Atacon, for example, Le Katsoku, the Truffaut, and so on and so on. So this film must have been very, very influential for many, many more filmmakers after him. Absolutely. It's a hugely important film for everyone. It's, it wasn't the only film on slums. It was, I think, the third Mexican film in the last three years and uh, that had been about uh, impoverished areas of Mexico City. But uh, this was the first one that was really set in the city and, and was, uh, did not have a, a, a nice message attached to it. Um, but yeah, it, it inaugurates, pro it probably does inaugurate uh, the mi miserabilism genre that we get loads of starting, especially in uh, Brazil uh, and Philippines, uh, you know, in the 1980s and 90s, late 70s uh, and beyond. You've seen City of Gods and uh, maybe some of you, and there's uh, some in South, uh, South Asia. <laughs> yeah, there are quite a few of them. This one is about as relentless as they get. And there were, it's not by any means the first film about downtrodden, downtrodden children. In fact, uh, that guy I mentioned, Deligny, uh, Bazan met him because he was trying to get <coughs> Nicholas X film, the 1932 film um, that's uh, about wayward children in the Soviet Union that all, like, all are saved by the communist system at the end of the film, but it's uh, famous, forgetting the name, uh, but, uh, but anybody remember what I'm thinking? Nicholas X, E-K-K, it's the... Uh, what's it? The Way to Life? Yes. The Road to Life, yeah, and uh, yeah, Der Weg, uh, I guess. Um, yes, The Way to Life, and there were American ones, Angels with Dirty Faces, um, and so on. But uh, this this one is really somewhat different from any of those. And I'm not sure Benoit would say it's even about children. I think he's uh, saying it's about the human condition, <laughs> uh, instinct. Yeah, I mean, as, as far as influences go, I couldn't help but see a bit of Breathless in the kind of end uh, in Hybo's demise, let's say. Oh. I, I wonder if there's a link there. I think there's a question up here, Bjorn. Like getting getting shot by the cops like that, uh, and then kind of like we get the close-up from above of you looking into the camera, but could be a coincidence. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, from the, I understand Spanish and I can confirm the, uh, it's really quite intelligible and uh, very little slang compared to City of God was mentioned. I mean, City of God, the kids in that film just use uh, <laughs> just profuse uh, <laughs> slang uh, every sentence and the way they speak compared to the uh, people from uh, the, the the middle class, people from Rio, the way they, they speak is completely different, whereas here it's much less uh, marked, that difference. Um should we be surprised at the way he portrays a uh, not exactly a prison system but a a farm work system as quite benevolent uh, given his politics it really goes to the idea that he embraces the welfare state model in the beginning of the film or somehow uh, thinks there's possible there's there's a there's a benevolent elite that can be reached out here that's a very good i i really hadn't put that together as fast as you did uh, that's exactly what the Former his former pals who were communists said about the film when they saw it in 1950 in December and said, uh, "Bunuel, well, you've you uh, the you've you've portrayed bourgeois reformism way too well uh, that, that you should have shown the police to be uh, really antagonists in this rather than uh, the kind of the pre thoughtfully at least some of them are reflectively trying to help." help out and, and you've got people with good intentions coming out of the middle class and they were really opposed to, well, they just made a few remarks evidently, but they were opposed to the film and even to having it, having, they thought Benwell had left, um, had left his communist roots behind. So We um, saw Viridiana a few weeks ago and I feel like that links into that film with this kind of, the problem isn't so much the the let's say evil intentions of the uh liberal state it's the impotence of it uh really like it's totally ineffective uh against the for this kind of much greater social forces of uh this entrenched poverty uh and for all the good intentions you might have uh 
as we also see in Verdiana, uh, there's very little in the end uh, you can do about that. There, there, although you can, re you could probably make an argument, can't you, that the, as the director says, in which we could put poverty in jail, because it's really why, why is. Why are things bad? Because the mother can't take care of the kids. Why can't she take care of it? Because she's having to work out of the house all the time because uh, she was um, she had a she didn't even know who the father was. It has many children. Um, all of those things probably, or not all, quite a few of them could be alleviated through money, uh, effectively at the redistribution of the wealth. I can see it um, that at least some of those things that he would have food to come home to. The yeah. Um, but I mean, I think Bunuel then would make films as he did, effectively later on, about uh, the excessive greed of people. Even once they do get meat, uh, they want more, and they'll still find ways to um, you know, lord it over others on the basis of, um, of the same instincts that you see at work at the lowest level here, the very lowest level of of hunger, just trying to get enough to stay alive. There's uh, uh, there's two things that make a quite difference from other films in this genre. I'm thinking of the Grapes of Wrath. There's no self-empowerment of the sub-proletarians here or some journey to politicization. And uh, the other is that there's no contrast, really, to wealthier quarters. And the link is obvious in terms of the social conditions that produce the desperation, but there's no contrast made to the to the wealthier quarters. Um, the dream sequences, uh, uh, specifically the one in the middle, are quite striking. And I'm racking my brains. I'm trying to think of a film made before 1951 that uses extended slow motion to this extent. Well, Zero for Conduct, is, right. it not only uses slow motion, but it also uses the, the feathers that are scattered in the room. And you see chicken feathers falling down under the bed, uh, at least for part of that scene. But uh, I also, the only example I could think of was La Talente as well, so maybe Javik is the only one. <laughs> well, no. there was uh, Fall of the House of Usher. Oh, exactly, which, Fall of the House of Usher. On which Bunuel was assistant director. That is true. So he, he was already working at Maybe he, maybe he first... saw what Epstein was doing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah so there's Epstein. Um, but yeah, he, he definitely went for... And there is also in... Um, in La Ch in uh, Machine and Delo, there's... So he's, he was already doing it, so it was part of his arsenal. And he couldn't wait to put it in. Uh, and it is the scene that's most discussed. Um, it's a it's pretty incredible sequence, actually. It's pretty un unforgettable. It almost could be in any film, or even it could be a short on its own. And maybe there's that, maybe it, it's, too, it's too attractive an item to fit into the film. It's but does it, I mean, what disrupts that attractiveness is the hunk of meat in the middle of it, right? Which is a kind of a very viscerally almost disgusting. I mean, it's raw meat. It's very, it's not very palatable. No, nothing, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's like by, a stain by attractive. Across I didn't mean it's a nice dream. No, it's a dream. I mean, it begins. No, but I mean, even as the image, yeah, right. the meat really kind of oh, it's disturbs the, the, the viewer's sense of the, of the frame almost. Right? It's horrible. But he's just been denied. I mean, it is, it's, uh, it's e easy to deal with it. It's it's a kind of core fantasy that uh, is the kind of thing that is an elaborated. All those elements are everything you see in there is distributed throughout the film in narrative fashion. Uh, the chicken feathers, the chicken coming down. First of all, I mean that we need to talk about the chickens. Uh, the uh, yeah, the meat, the bloody face um, of the of I guess it's um, Julian under the bed. Then Haibo coming up and grabbing the meat and. And the mother coming forward first in a very seductive way, uh, and then uh, it's yeah, it's really um, got it all. And the soundtrack, the sound of it, uh, is really striking. Okay, um, good evening. My name is Longu. I'm an international student from Nigeria. I just want to take it from a different aesthetic perspective. Uh, recently, there's a movie produced in Nollywood, Gangs of Lagos. Similar, virtually closely similar to this. Well, one thing I find very, very interesting is uh, why Pedro could not speak to his mom. You know, he couldn't. Yeah, he could. And uh, I, I felt, uh, 
what kind of uh, theory will I lie to read? Is it Gertrude Spivak? Can the subordinate speak? But that's his mom. You know, but I find it very striking. In sharp contrast to gangs of Lagos, yeah, still group of friends, young boys. I don't know if the director maybe <laughs> maybe watch this, yeah. but something like this, a little slight difference. They were able to grow up in all of it, but the police in that particular community, uh, who were they protecting? Because there were no bigger shots there. It's still the slum and the slum thing. So what's the, what's the, what's the role of the police there? Well, that's, uh, that's easier to, to, uh, to answer than, than the question about the mother. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Gangs of Lagos. I've been reading about it. Um, and now I really need to see it. Uh, so the police aren't there, in part because the film is shot almost entirely in, in mid-shot. I mean, uh, there are some, you get some, some expanse sh shots, but uh, so there's not a chance to see how this place is coordinated. It's not uh, a policeable area. Lagos may be the same, uh, and maybe there's a way that they, the police have f managed to coordinate their presence. But here, it looks like the police can't even, couldn't even operate. It's a little bit like the Casba in Pepe Lomoco. The police can't get in there because it's, uh, it's run by the, the gangs that are there, pretty much. And the, the alleyways are too small, although we do see some expanses, and they are clearing things out to try to make room for these new buildings. So you're going to have more police presence. It's just the forgotten. That's why it's called Los Olvidados. These are the forgotten ones. They just shove them. This is the subproletariat. It's not just normal poor people. <laughs> this is where the people are there when, that have no parents. You just saw that little kid dropped off by his father, and it's evidently a daily occurrence. Um, so there's the. I think the police are. I mean, they might be around, kind of. Uh, you can see Hypo worried when he's in town at the very beginning when he's thinking of stealing a sandwich. The police, he can hear the siren and he's he's taken off. And he, but where does he go? He goes to where he knows uh, he can he can hide out. So that's easier. And you may there may be other things to say about that. The question of the why he can't speak to his mother. It's a very it's very well put. It's the best question best way to put the question and he the boy asks his mother that effectively why aren't you loving me you're supposed to love me and um, it's not clear she says you know and maybe it's because she was raped he's the he's the product of uh, of a trauma that she doesn't um, want to uh, revisit uh, but he's also um, then the man of the house and he's not helping out so she's She's exuding him. He is the abject. It is true. Uh, what you say is really is really correct there. That uh, and this film is about abjection in uh, in the sense of the the cow and the bed, the things that aren't supposed to be there being th thought. They're in the world, but they aren't supposed to be part of your world. They're the excrement, um, the detritus, the junk heap that he falls into at the end. Um, so, but why does the mother? And she, but she, she does come back. There is that moment of uh, change. And I don't know if it's something that Bunuel actually believes in or if he thinks this is some things that people do. They are cruel to each other, but then they also have changes of heart. She calls him darling and kisses him on the head and tells Kaibo that she doesn't want him around anymore. All that happens in about four seconds uh, at that one moment when she finally is confronted in a place of authority with somebody. When she recognizes when he says, we're taking him away from you because you can't mother him. And, uh, but you're right, it, it, we don't get the backstory on that except that he's the product of, uh, of a sexual encounter that she doesn't even remember or, or can't, um, can't deal with at this point. Um, any, anybody else have ideas about that? But it, 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 there is, and it's our own problem today, the you know, problem of uh, single parenting uh, and lack of you know, family surveillance over children, and at least in the US, it's a huge problem in education. You can pretty much count up the, uh, the difficulties that schools have when, they, when the children are unsupervised and don't have parents they can talk to or who can you know, interact with them. And they immediately go into, they find other structures. They go into gang type behavior and antisocial behavior because they don't have a family to dissipate that or to help coordinate it. It's, I'm hardly one to talk about social science, but um, why that happens in this when you have a, oh, I should mention that the, uh, that, um, the mother is really, has been talked about in the, in the literature in this film 
as a Malinka character, the, 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 the f woman who consorted with the Spanish conquerors when they came in, she said, uh, and uh, betrayed the country. She was the image of Mexico. And this is why, this is the main reason that the Mexicans uh, audiences and several of the people on the, on the crew and the set uh, and cast uh, rejected the film after they saw it, or when they saw what it was going to it, because of the way she's treated. She's dressed up like, uh, or cast as the beautiful Mexican mother, uh, who, and she refuses food to her son. Um, and they just said, this can't happen. It's a, the, this is a betrayal that, uh, and you're suggesting that Mexico itself conspired in its own degradation, which is, part of the, one of the great myths they have of uh, their female betrayal, uh, which is a really misogynist kind of national myth that, uh, that you know, remains in Mexico. And this film participates in suggesting, it, uh, in suggesting that. So it was, that is a, the, mother, the mothering is also the national mother. Um, that, and then the issue of milk. Uh, I, mean, we were, I would, thought we would go through some of the real <laughs> the things that Bunuel really loves to focus on. He makes this film because of material things that he wants to put together. And it's milk and meat, and milk and sucking milk from a goat's tit. <laughs> when the, one, the country boy knows how to do that, is he loves, this is the kind of scene that Bunuel likes. Not simply because we're not used to seeing it, but because it's so physical, and it brings mouths and bodies together, animals and people. Um, and the meat scene is, you know, it, I think he, this is what he was a Bunuel was a carnivore, but I'm sure he thought about this. this he, I'm sure he was around the Cavalcanti film Rien que les Heures, where the the meat on the plate of the bourgeois people turns into the cow, and you get to see it slaughtered. Uh, all of this, is, I think, matters to him. The chickens, of course, and the beating of the chickens, uh, the dog at the end. With um, it's full of things like, but the milk in this instance uh, is something that the Car Carmen comes back to. I want to hear about Carmen too. The um... I wanted to maybe we should be winding up probably, because <laughs> uh, you brought up Ojitos, uh, the young country boy, who also seems to be more so than the other characters that say coded as uh, indigenous oh, yeah. uh, rather than European, uh, and is also like this kind of figure of innocence throughout the film, but then. The gag at the end where he's like, yeah, yeah, stab it. <laughs> stab it. I mean, that's a very scandalous moment because uh, a very different side to his character is revealed. And it's like the, no one is, uh, it seems like no one is redeemable in this film. Everybody becomes yeah, more and more violent, uh, including, and even the, the grandfather figure who, um, and even Meke, who's the, you know, the lovely young adolescent girl who looks like she's got the right instincts, she wants to help people out and so on, she's not even objecting to th tossing this kid's body into the dump heap. Which reminds me, if you've seen Las Hurdas, the uh, Land Without Bread, of the donkey falling off the cliff, uh, it's just another piece of meat to, uh, that Bunuel was ready to dispose of, because you probably know he conspired to have that <laughs> animal shot and then thrown down. Um, and you get to see, he also doesn't mind killing a few chickens either. People that complain about Renoir killing rabbits in Rules of the Game. You actually see some chickens, be, but we, uh, he did have scenes in which chickens' heads were, uh, were removed. The, the, if you tally up the animal toll from Buñuel's oeuvre, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty grisly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, animals were hurt. <laughs> uh, I think maybe just a last question here from Mo Motion, if you want to. Yeah, um, it was actually a really, really interesting film. Um, for me, actually, what was really interesting by kind of looking at this film was looking at people and animals in one environment. Mm -hmm. And everyone, including the animals, they were obviously behaving animalistically. Um, and then even the last, um, the last scene, it was kind of like a, like a vicious circle that everything will be recycled. Everyone's life is depending on um, one of the other um, person or animal in this environment. And even the last sequence, the last scene, he'll be returned to, the, to this circle. Probably he'll be eaten by the dogs or some animals. 
And um, what was really interesting that it was kind of like um, everyone was kind of like feeding from each other um, and behaving um, from their instincts. Um, no wonder why the mother doesn't want to talk to to her son, even if he was a bastard, if he wanted, if he, even if he was a product of a um, of a rape. Um, but she doesn't want to do it because she she behaves um, from her instincts. She goes with um, her desire rather than talking to the son. But she should have a. I think the point is he, she should have a maternal desire. She should, should have a maternal instinct, and that's what seems to be turned. But that's off. what I'm just saying. It's just so animalistic. <laughs> they, they just go with the basic instincts and, and the hunger, the um, the sexual desire, and then go back to the hunger and then come back to it again. But animals also protect their young. Yeah. And so this and these don't particularly. That's what's so mm -hmm. I just thought about the connection between the Thief's Journal by Jean Genet and yeah. this film. I know that maybe she's if if it's possible that Bunuel read it before. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure he did. It was also Truffaut's favorite book. Okay. Nineteen forty four, I think, right? Or something like that. 40. Yeah. Yeah, because, like, as you spoke about the dignity of, of this of the violence, like of the. Doing like the cheap tricks, and I think it's very beautiful also in collection in relation to that book. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's. Uh, Vincent, did you have a comment before we give Dudley the list? Ah, sorry, didn't see you there, Tamara. <laughs> Uh, I was just thinking about uh, when we talked about uh, Jaibo uh, evilness. I think the movie kind of give him justice by showing the evilness of the adults. Like uh, you, you, f you think like he's such a horrible character and he scares ev everyone. But like when you see the adults in the movie, like for example the blind man or the guy at the carousel, you're like. You have no other option in this world, either to be evil because you will be treated in a bad way. So I mean, like, he, I think he just like the reproduction of his own world, and he's just he's not right because like he's so such a bad guy. But in the same time, it's just like some kind of uh, uh, not predestination, but like uh, it's such it's a social thing to do. I don't know if I'm clear. Well, he's definitely trying to find some sense of self-projection. Um, he wants to stand, be able to stand up for himself in the morning. <laughs> and his way of doing that is to um, I I interact with uh, whoever he's in front of by dominating them, either through having them coordinate around himself or aggressing those who are about him. So that's, and in that sense, that's why I was comparing him to St. Francis, you know, as a in, in a way, it's the same. It's just a rural situation. We're also poorer, without food, often, and having to confront other kinds of things. So it's, I, I think that's right. That he's, um, it's his need to, uh, it's his identity. I mean, when he's trying to, he's building an identity in a reactive formation uh, that is. In a way, very obvious. Some some of the some of the film is obvious when the psychologist says, "Oh, you're hitting the hens because you want to hit us, the police," and Pedro says, "Yes." <laughs> I, I, we all laughed at that. I hope uh, so. That is that is psychoanalysis <laughs> presented, accepted, and dismissed by Bunuel, as far as I can tell. Uh, but so the, I don't know. It's the, the, I the film is so unclear, but Benoit says what he cares most about in films and why he doesn't think neorealism is as interesting as surrealism is it doesn't have as much mystery in it. And he wants the mystery, even in these characters, even in Carmen, who's, for a while there was a moment when he came in and he's so preternatural, he can hear, see everything. He's a kind of destiny character that, uh, in, that Jacques Prévert might have written about, who's able to walk around and kind of knows what's happening before it's happening. And yet he's so awful. Um, right after you think that he's going to, you know, uh, you know, ha have an opportunity to defeat the 
because he's an, he's an outcast even beyond the others. He's blind. But Bunuel hated blind people for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but he, he just thought that, and he knew that they had extra powers, and he was very disturbed by them. And he beats the guy, and or has him beaten. And then he, uh, and then he's a lecher as well, going after the, uh, the little girl. That's, I don't know, but finally the, the film comes down to like a quartet of pairs that uh, in the script writing aspect is really pretty um, clean. Pedro and Haibo, Pedro and his mother, uh, Ojito, Little Eyes, and Carmen, uh, Ojito and Meche, who takes care of him. You've got these pairs that, and they're just connected enough that one will allow you to lead to the next, and which is why the film can proceed as smoothly as it does, because it's also a set of anecdotes, like the Flowers of Francis, um, but it, it has more cohesiveness, way more than Rossellini's film has. So I was impressed by that, um, and maybe by the use of, underuse of music. Uh, Peter, Luga's, Peter Luga's music is really quite acceptable, and very few films of that period strike us that way anymore, <laughs> I think. Uh, so it's, it's got a smoothness to it at the same time as it's, it's sharp. And I think the beatings, if you just look at all the pictures of people hitting something, it comes like a, um, like a beat in a poem, which is why people talk about Bunuel's poetry. Well, it's both the strange images and the, that stick out as poetic or surrealist images, but also a kind of rhythm that he, I think, really has. He pulls this into 80 minutes. And then you think about trying to make all those shots in all those locations in 18 days, it's really astounding um, that he could, he could pull it off with that amount of consistency and with, with those actors. So there are, there are contradictions. I mean, I think I, I didn't mention the discovery, some of you may know of it, the discovery in 2004 at the uh, university archives of an alternate ending. Do you know about this? He shot an alternate ending. And I, it really makes me angry because he said, I will never concede a minute to anybody. I'm going to make the film the way I want. He shot a happy ending to the film. <laughs> uh, but it, evidently, it was done on, like, on the last day, even after the last day of shooting, because there, there are pictures of, um, of everybody in, with their costumes off except for the two characters who were in the last scene. So they, it was really done at the last five minutes. And it has... Uh, Haibo actually being killed by Pedro with his knife at the end, and then Pedro walking back to the reform school mm -hmm. uh, and being accepted, accepted back and going. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's never been shown. Well, it was, oh. uh, they shot it because <laughs> because uh, um, the uh, Oscar uh, Dotsiger said after three days, I'm losing so much money. This film is gone. You know. It's only fifty thousand dollars, but for another eighty dollars, <laughs> we might be able to get another screening of it somewhere else. But it's got to have a happy ending. So I guess he felt he needed to do that since he had already lost the game. But then he won the game thanks because he kept the old ending. So. Well, we can all go home tonight and dream about the happy ending <laughs> of Los Olvidados uh, that has met. Uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, we could keep talking about the film all night long, but uh, we should get some sleep. Uh, so thank you very much. Dudley has an early uh, train to Paris tomorrow, so uh, let's let him get back to his hotel room. Uh, thank you once more to Dudley. We'll be back in uh, two weeks' time uh, with Pizzi Fenstra on Bjorn, help me with the film title. The Exterminating Angel. Exterminating Angel. So uh, come back in two weeks' time on May 25th to continue our exploration of Bunuel.